I'm Chad Reed. I'm Hillary Langer. I'm Gil Jenkins. And this is Climate Positive. It doesn't tell them what to do. It doesn't mean they can't use oil. They have to do this or that. It doesn't require any actions of them except for disclosure. And then what the theory is the market will decide. If investors, customers, employees have good information, they'll make decisions. Disclosure, disclosure, disclosure. In early March, the SEC issued final climate-related disclosure rules for U.S. public companies. Designed to enhance standardization and in response to increasing investor demand, the new rules mandate companies disclose material climate risks they face and greenhouse gas emissions they generate, as well as other material climate-related information. While not as comprehensive as existing mandatory climate disclosure regimes in the European Union or California, the rules represent a groundbreaking step forward in climate disclosure across the United States. So in this episode, I discuss the new rules, their implications, and their detractors with Stephen Rothstein, Managing Director at the Series Accelerator for Sustainable Capital Markets. Stephen and his colleagues at Series, over two decades, have been instrumental in building a large and powerful investor coalition in support of greater climate disclosure and provide crucial insights on this complex and significant public policy issue. Stephen, thank you for joining us today. It's a real pleasure to have you. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, before we jump into our topic du jour, as I was reading your bio, I was struck by your lifelong commitment to causes greater than yourself, importantly, but not exclusively climate action. Where do you think this drive comes from? It's really from my family that we're in very privileged, white, middle, upper middle class. And, you know, the expression that those that much is given, much is expected and so I, the values of my parents, who've both since the past, and I've met so many remarkable people who I've learned from, mostly in the nonprofit sector that I work with, but also obviously people in the corporate sector and government as well, that it's been very rewarding and stimulating. Tell us how you found your way to Series. You're now a managing director for the Series Sustainable Capital Markets Program. How did you find your way there and what do you focus on at Series? Well, I spent over 20 years on energy environmental issues and 20 years on a variety of other issues. And in 2019, the board and, and Mindy and the direct, uh, senior people at Ceres wanted to do more with financial sector and more with regulators. And so I was recruited. I'm the founding managing director, Ceres Accelerator. And we work with all kinds of sectors. I mean, Ceres does, but I tend to focus both on the financial sector banks, insurance, accounting, investors, and with all of their regulatory bodies, which the United States is a lot of them, with the theory of, and, and with corporate governance, with the theory of change is that if those entities, if they change their rules for capital, uh, that it will affect the entire economy. Right. Well, there have been some pretty big changes to rules finalized uh, just in the last few weeks. As you know very well, the SEC published landmark rules to enhance and standardize climate-related disclosures for investors. As SEC Chair Gary Gensler explained upon the release of the rules, our federal securities laws lay out a basic bargain. Investors get to decide which risks they want to take so long as companies raising money from the public make what Franklin Roosevelt called complete and truthful disclosure. So first, tell us why these new rules are so significant or as President Biden once said, a BFD. Absolutely. They, they definitely are. So Ceres had its first meeting with investors, with the SEC in 2003, because investors are saying they want good information. For them to invest, they're not just looking at the next quarter. They're looking at the next quarter century and beyond. And a lot's going to change. You know, what will happen with fires, floods, tornadoes? What about new technologies, EVs? You can go through the long list. So a lot's changing. The one thing we know about our society is the pace of change is just getting quicker. And some of those are good and some of those are bad. So investors say they want more information on a variety of those risks, climate being one of them, not the only one, of course. But inflation, recession, pandemic, there's a long list. And so then in 2010, the SEC issued climate disclosure guidelines, not requirements, guidelines. And there have been a variety of conversations since. In the last two years, there have been a lot of comments. So why is it important? So investors can make good decisions. 
The SEC is not, I repeat, not an environmental agency. That's not their job. Their job is to provide transparency and disclosure for investors so they can they can fuel the capital markets. I mean, the United States is a very robust capital market. We are we kind of punch above our weight, so to speak, in terms of what's happening around the world. And so having that disclosure is critical. It's also part of the worldwide trend. We'll get into that trend uh, momentarily, but first, focusing still here on the U.S., what specifically do the rules mandate? So first, we're talking about for public companies. So out of the, you know, hundreds of thousands of companies in the United States, there are about 7,000, maybe 8,000 public companies. And even and, and, and even within that, the smallest ones have less requirements than the largest ones. So it's a small number, but it's the big brands that people know, publicly traded companies, and that they're also, because of the size, they also have the largest emitters because they buy more, whatever it might be, products and services. And so that it doesn't tell them, let me first say what it doesn't do and then tell you what it, they do. It doesn't tell them what to do. It doesn't mean they can't use oil or they have to do this or that. It doesn't require any actions of them except for disclosure. And then what the theory is the market will decide if investors, customers, employees, have good information, they'll make decisions. So it requires, as part of the financial statements, to have climate information. Just as right now, if there's an audited statement, and if three years ago, I haven't looked, but I'll bet every company in their audited statement listed something about the pandemic, because it was a big financial either risk or in some companies upside. And that, but that was a, a, a societal issue, a science-based issue that had a financial impact. Nat today, whether it be if you're, if your company or your supply chain is an area where there's fires, floods, tornadoes, droughts, or transition because of the economy, it's important to list it. So you're supposed to list the, the key areas and there's a variety of criteria, both as financial information and greenhouse gas emission data should be listed. So every year, public companies like Hasi, we issue an annual report. And in that annual report, we obviously provide a lot of detail on the financial uh, performance of the company over the last year and the condition of our balance sheet. And and there are a lot of risk factors that we are required to uh, consider and, 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 and discuss in the report uh, of a number of factors that could impact our business uh, going forward. Uh, not just ones that we've already faced in the previous year. So now with these new rules, uh, if the company isn't already talking about climate related risks in its disclosures, it is required to do so, right? Correct. If they're what's called material, if they're significant. So again, it's not like, like right now for, for Hasi or any other company, you do financial reports, but you don't include every receipt where you buy pizza. It's not or whatever it is, that's not material. It's the significant decisions. Same on climate. It's it's the significant areas where it would make an impact to the company or investors. Give us one example of a climate-related risk a company might face that they'll now definitely have to disclose if they weren't doing so before. Yeah, so I'll give you, let me just give you two because they're very different. One is if your company directly or indirectly gets parts that go through the Panama Canal, an enormous number of of, of uh, Parts for all kinds of equipment go through the Panama Canal. There's a drought there. That means 40% less ships are going through. So if you are counting on your ship to come by X date to sell by a certain holiday, that might be late. And if you if you can't get your component, you're not selling your product. That is a business risk. It's driven from a climate factor, but it's a business financial risk. Another one is if you make spark plugs or something – that is an internal combustion engine, and 10 years from now, there are not going to be a lot of new internal combustion engines sold. There'll be more and more EVs. So that line of business might stop, might go down. So there could be a loss opportunities, or a flip side, it could be growth opportunities, depending on what, what your business is. So it could be based on physical risks, a drought, a fire, a flood. And it's not just your company, it's your supply chain. We all learned during the pandemic whether you think about from diapers to microchips, at some point there were, there were all kinds of uh, shortages and, and delays in the marketplace. So the supply chain is very uh, interwoven and a fire in one state or a drought in another state could affect your company 
in a completely different area. In terms of the risks, you have to discuss both physical risks, that the things that are happening in the climate that have an impact on your business operations, your supply chain, et cetera, and transitional risks, uh, which are basically as the economy changes to either adapt to climate change and or mitigate climate change, there are going to be changes to the business environment that will impact your company likely as well. And so you need to report both of those sorts of risks. And there was an existing framework called the Task Force for Climate Related Disclosures, or TCFD, upon which this part of the regulation is based. Can you just talk a little bit about that and how that interplays with this part of the regulation? 30 years ago, there was not a lot of climate disclosure. Then there were a variety of systems built up. They were voluntary. In 2017, under the auspice of the United Nations, Mike Bloomberg and others set up the TCFT, the Task Force for Climate-Related Disclosure, and it is principles-based. So it, this gets into what are your key governance elements? What is risk management? What is scenario analysis? So understanding your thinking. Uh, since that time, thousands of companies have started to use it. Hundreds of insurers, for example, 80% of the insurance companies in the United States are using it, but it's used around the world. It's becoming very much the standard. It's now being built into what is called the International Sustainability Standard Board, and it's also being built into the SEC and many others. So it's becoming more and more the standard. Again, they're, they're not, uh, I want to be clear, they're not del- the SEC is not delegating to TCFD, but they're incorporating many of the key provisions that are in there. And without getting too technical, the way that the SEC rule deals with physical risk and transition risk is slightly different. Uh, they cover more elements in in physical risk, transition risk, it really depends on the materiality and other factors, which, again, I'm happy, but it's probably too technical for this conversation. Right, right. Well, we might get into materiality a little bit, but let's talk about it. So it's not just physical risk, physical, I'm sorry, climate risk. Climate risk is one aspect of the new regulations. Another big aspect of these regulations are greenhouse gas emissions. So companies like Hasi, we've actually been reporting the scope one, scope two, and scope three greenhouse gas operations from our company for several years now, actually. And these these the standard is, is is the greenhouse gas protocol that WRI and, and other NGOs helped develop years ago. A lot of companies already voluntarily report these emissions. And now the SEC saying, actually, if 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 emissions are material, um, there's this materiality standard again, as far as I understand it, you need to report scope one and two emissions. Is that how it works? Correct. Yeah. And again, for your listeners, and, and Hasi deserves enormous credit for be doing this in a leadership way and voluntary. And really, that's very important for you, your customers, your investors, suppliers. But it's also a great sign of leadership. Scope one is, again, for the, those who are not in the weeds on this, is a description of the greenhouse gas emissions from making your widget, your part, your supply, whatever it is, kind of your manufacturing process, your office process, et cetera. Scope two is the energy you purchase from others, gas, electricity, coal, whatever it might be, to run your buildings or plants. And scope three is your supply chain and everything else. Um, so they do, as you say, if it's material, require scope one and scope two, and scope three is voluntary. And and we'll make it into that a little bit later. But a couple other aspects of the the new regulations are you have to disclose if if you've made climate targets. So you said we're we're a company, we we want to be a green company, a good company, and we want to be net zero in terms of our emissions by whatever year, 2050, 2030, if you're very aggressive. Uh, if you if you set such a climate target, you need to disclose it, you need to disclose how the progress you're making towards it. Is that right? Yeah. And again, just to go back, as I said earlier, the SEC is not an environmental agency. So it's not that they're judging the environmental. What they're saying is if you've made a target, that affects your significant decisions and, and that companies, your investors want to know that. I'll give you an example. If a car company says, I'm going to go all electric by 2035, and that's tens or hundreds of billions of dollars of capital to retool. It affects their employees or unions or contracts. So it's a big, strategic decision and investors want to know how they're going to get there and are they, where, where will they be by say 2030 or whatever the right milestones are. So it is, the key thing is what will investors want to know? And in some cases, these are massive investments to either look for opportunities 
and or to protect for downside risk. And the final aspects that we'll talk here, at least, of the rules is board and management oversight of climate-related risks and, and emissions. Talk a little bit about that in the rule. So the, the rule says, again, based on the TCFD, the Task Force for Climate Related Disclosure, that they want to understand how the board is involved. So they don't, they don't prescribe. The SEC doesn't say to the board, oh, you have to have a climate committee or you have to do something else. But just describe how the board gets information. You know, and if you have a committee, share that. But if you don't, that's okay. Uh, what, what information you get? And then how do you, and then the structure of the senior management in terms of climate reporting as well. So it's based on this principle that if you understand how decisions are made, that'll help you understand moving forward and you being investors. For example, if, if someone says our board never talks about climate or our board talks about it every meeting, I'm just using those as examples. That might give an investor more or less confidence, irrespective of whatever the answer, specific answer might be. Climate Positive is produced by Hassi, a leading climate investment firm that actively partners with clients to deploy real assets that facilitate the energy transition. To learn more, visit Hassi.com. Let's jump in because all of these pillars basically are subject to the, the materiality concept or threshold. And and I, I, we don't have to get too, too in the weeds in it, but I think it's a very important part of this rule. So I do want to touch on it in a little bit more detail than we already have. And that is, what does materiality mean <laughs> broadly? And let's say outside the climate perspective, just financial materiality. And then how is it applicable to the rules themselves and how will it shape how companies respond to these rules? Yeah, it's a great question. And I'm not a lawyer, so don't take this as my legal opinion. But um, Supreme Court has ruled on this issue of materiality, again, not climate, but overall. And what they've said is, is there is not a bright line, but it's what a reasonable investor would want to know to buy or sell stock or to vote on a shareholder resolution. So in some cases, it could be if 5%, it affects revenue. Well, in some cases, that could be material. In some cases, it's not. In some cases, it could be a very small number you know, man management structure compensation. So it's understanding what is material to investors and and then sharing that. There will be some time where the society will go through a process to, to learn that. And some companies like yours are already being very forward thinking. In fact, 90 today, 92% of Fortune 500 companies share some kind of climate information on their website or sustainability report, but it's in different methodologies. This will ensure, the SEC will ensure that it's consistent. And materiality, while, you know, we had recommended against adding materiality standard, we understand why they picked it, it will avoid the smaller, you don't have, you don't have to worry about the small things. Again, did the person who deliver your pizza did he or she come in a bicycle or a car? What's the emissions? Like that's not that's not material. It's not relevant. It's really the big decisions that will affect the strategy for the company. So there was a bit of chatter about this rule when it came out, obviously, a few weeks ago, criticizing from both sides, really, you know, from from the more left-leaning side or, or very pro-environmentalist side. There were some folks concerned that certain things were left out of these rules. Let's let's talk about that a little bit right now. What what were the primary concerns? What are the primary concerns of, of those who who feel like maybe the rules haven't gone far enough? Just as context before I answer that specifically. So the rule came out on March 6th. Since then there have been nine separate lawsuits. Two from environmental groups would say it didn't go far enough and seven from either business associations, oil industry, Republican attorneys general, or others. Of those that didn't say go far enough, is, is a lot of it had to do with scope three. That scope three is voluntary and, and thinking it should be mandatory. And we would have advocated that as well. But then there are other concerns about some adding the materiality threshold and some other things. But the key, the key, if you had to boil it down to one issue, it was scope three. Got it, got it. And so why do you think the SEC didn't include scope three. So scope three, again, is the, the emissions from one supply chain. From, from, from Hasi's perspective, is not necessarily always easy to measure, and there aren't necessarily well-developed standards for each type of supply chain emission that a company could encounter. And so what, why do you think the SEC right now said, you know what, we're not going to require scope three if you deem it material even? 
Right. I would never say what somebody else thought, but I can give you my, my perspective is that this rule generated 24,000 comments, more than any time, to the best of our knowledge, that since the SEC was established 91 years ago. And 80% were supportive, but 20% were opposed of the investors. 95% were supportive, including of scope three. 96% actually. And, and, and if you read the common file and we read, you know, thousands of the letters, the most controversial element was scope three. There were also a number of elected officials that were very strong on both sides of that issue. So part of it was, and, and there's some parties who have said, oh, they're going to sue, which again, they already have done that. So I think it's a combination of what you said that it is, well, scope three has been used for 20 years. And there are many companies doing it. It's growing every year. It is more complicated than scope one and scope two to measure. There are 15 different criteria. I won't go through all the details now, but it's, um, there's a variety of elements. So part of it is it's harder to measure. Part of it is they want to have a rule. And, and we understand this. that's sustainable, meaning that when the court looks at it, it's going to seem the most reasonable. The SEC, their jurisdiction is over publicly traded companies. So if this would have, and scope three would have required non-public companies, non-registered companies, th- there were lawyers on both sides of that question, whether that was beyond their scope or not. And the SEC, I think, again, without saying exactly what they were thinking, uh, it, it would not surprise me if one of their thinking is they don't want to push that issue. There's so much here. And from our perspective, we would rather have a good rule and move it forward then have a great rule and spend more time in court and never get it implemented. Yeah, and I think that, I think that's a really great point, and I I do think that that's probably part of the SEC's calculation here is is that given the legal environment, they were concerned that the rule itself would be fully or mostly struck down if uh, this more difficult uh, disclosure requirement were included. But even though it wasn't, as you noted, there are already at least seven lawsuits filed by those who are opposed to the rule. And it's actually, I believe, still the rule is is been stayed, temporarily postponed, basically, until the, I believe now it's the Eighth Circuit, uh, the Court of Appeals hears challenges to the rule. I don't want to get too much into the, the legal weeds here, but what are the primary objections to the rule? Just broadly from those who are not supportive of it. And then well, let's do that first, and then we'll, we'll talk legal. Again, these are what the other side says. I don't believe these arguments, but that some would say it goes beyond the scope of the SEC. That's one. Second is there's this concept of major questions that says if there is a big policy issue, that that has to be decided by Congress, not regulators. And some would say this is a big policy issue. While it's very significant, I don't want to underestimate that. The reality is the, um, if you go back in the records, starting the 1970s, it may have been even earlier, but we, we've aware since the 1970s, the SEC has had environmental issues as part of their record. It could be asbestos. It could be other things. And then obviously the 2010 climate disclosure guideline that has been involved. And in fact, there have been, fines against that for companies who have not followed, even though it's a guideline, because they don't feel the companies have, have done enough. But though, there are other issues too about different elements. Um, then there are some people say, oh, the timing, you need more time both to implement and then to gather information at the end of the year. But then there are other legal issues too, but those are some of the major ones. What's interesting in what you just discussed is that very few people are, are, making the argument that complying with these rules will be too onerous, right? There, there obviously will be some compliance costs. It does cost some amount of money to measure your emissions and report them and to think about your climate risks and to report that as well. Uh, but it's really not, we're not talking about large sums of, of money here. And as you noted, 92% of the Fortune 500 companies in the U.S. today already report some measure of climate risk or, or greenhouse gas emissions. That's right. Yeah, yeah, it is about 92%. And just on the, on the cost, it's clearly that is an argument from the other side. It's too costly. It's too burdensome to get us information. It's too imprecise. One of the things, for example, that, that the regulation includes is a legal safe harbor, meaning if somebody files information in good faith and they get better information, which will happen. I mean, this is like lots of areas. It's an evolving area that it gives them legal protection against sued. I thought my missions were X. 
Next year, I get a more refined data. So it's really gone up or gone down. It, that's, it's to protect them against that. It doesn't protect them against lying and, and things like that. But if you're using good faith, uh, that's clearly part of the intent. So the, the materiality thresholds, the safe harbor, which protects companies who act in good faith from unnecessary lawsuits, all those things are designed to make it realistic and not too burdensome for companies to comply with this new rule. And so what is the timing for implementation? How does that look? So first, it's either, I think it's just been published in the Federal, Federal Register. Then there's a 60-day clock to get it official. Then there is a timing and they've broken it down by the size of the companies. There is something called a large accelerator filer, accelerator filer, and then the others. And so the large accelerated, which are, I can explain, but it's really, it's the largest companies within the SEC. They have to start collecting their data next year and reporting in 26 is, is a round number for the financial information. For the, for the carbon related information, the greenhouse gas emission, that's a longer period. And then there's also a phase in period of assurance, of third party assurance. When companies do audited statements, they have an accountant look at it. And it's, it's part of our capital markets to think about this. This was actually controversial when it was proposed in the early days of the SEC without getting too technical, limited assurance. And then over years, for the largest companies goes to reasonable, but that's not till 2023. So it's, a, it gets, it's, they've been very, um, some people think too slow. Some people think it's still too fast. From our perspective, they, they've been more than generous with companies in terms of, uh, how long it takes to complete this. These rules exist, as we alluded to earlier, in a larger environment, whether internationally or, or state level in the U.S where there are other regulatory regimes. In Europe, it's the CSRD. And California has also issued climate-related mandatory disclosures for, for all companies that do business in California. How does this rule fit into, stack up against uh, some the other regimes out there? So like many of your great questions, this is one that I could spend just an hour on this alone, but at a very high level. The Europeans, what they're calling CSRD, the European rule is much more expansive. It covers more companies and it asks for more information. I'll give you one example. There are several, but one example is in the U.S., you really look at the climate risks that will affect the business of the company. So the financial impact of the company, because that's what investors are focusing on. In Europe, in addition to the climate impact affecting the company, you're also looking at the company's impact on society. So if the company is having a negative impact on, on climate, but it won't affect their financials, then it's not something you have to report to the SEC. So that's called single versus double materiality. That's an example. Um, California, on the other hand, is broader in that it covers public and private companies. It is just a revenue threshold for their two laws. 253 is a billion dollar or more of revenue. 261 is 500 million or more of revenue. So, but, it, and, and that includes, it's projected that uh, over half of that will be private companies as well. So they're, they're SEC covers a lot and it's important because it is the SEC and from a worldwide standard, but the Europeans do go further. If you've, if a company has already filled out or working to fill out the European CSRD, they're kind of going to cut, I mean, most of their work for the SEC will be done. They have to do a separate report, but it's essentially, it's a portion of that CSRD that will go to the SEC. Right. So the European rules, more expensive, more companies are kind of roped into them. They require double materiality, whereas the, SEC, the US SEC rules that we're just talking about are single materiality. And then in California, covers public and private companies and also includes scope three. So if, if you are doing business in, in California, you do have to report uh, scope three if you meet the revenue thresholds of that rule. So the SEC seems like it's it struck a, a good balance in, in many respects, uh, in my view, and getting a rule that's meaningful, that's impactful, but that's also reasonable in terms of, of who has to comply and the timeline by which they have to comply and the the burdens of complying itself. Any other thoughts you have, Stephen, that you want to share on the rule? Think about the next step of a ladder. So if you haven't done any reporting, start to gather the information. If you don't have a 
company-wide task force, because this affects purchasing and human resources and capital planning and every group, put that together. If you've done scope one, work on scope two. If you've done scope two, work on scope three. Talk to your, your I just had a meeting recently with a number of CFOs, and now this can be built more into the financial statements. There's a deeper connection with the CFOs and, and, and those partners. So wherever you are in that process, think about what's the next step to get ready. And it's not just Oh, I want to be ready exactly when the SEC tells me. If you can think about as Hasi has done to show leadership, because your investors want to know, uh, your employees want to know. So there's a there's a real upside. The way I think about it is, don't think about collecting this information as just a cost center, but as a marketing and revenue opportunity. And to bring it back into again, why this is all important, it empowers investors, um, including retail investors, small investors, like. You and me, Stephen, I'm sure we have uh, each some shares in, in, in a retirement account or whatever of, of some company. And we want to know whether that company is responding to climate related risks and taking this, this issue seriously. And so it empowers us to make better decisions and simply through the act of, of requiring disclosure and not requiring companies to do anything in particular, just to disclose what they're doing on these issues. So. It's a great summation, Stephen. Thank you. So first, we're almost done, um, but now we have the hot seat. So ask for your quick uh, reactions to the following statements. One thing I've changed my mind on is that I am more optimistic despite the challenges we are facing in our political system. The key ingredient to my productivity is being associated with good, smart, honest, hardworking people. Hmm. That's a great one. To recharge, I spend time with family and exercise. The book that has influenced me most is? There are several, but there is there's one on leadership written by Marty Linsky that had a big impact. Okay. I want the next generation to know. That my generation screwed things up, but at least we tried to make it a little better. I have a new granddaughter and I'm, I'm, I'm very excited, but you know, when she's in, you know, 10 years from now, 30 years from now, I'm worried about the world. And so that we're trying to address some of the problems we've created. And to me, climate positive means that there is good information, transparent information, and that we are working to reduce emissions. And that's not a limiting economic growth. We are growing our economy while we're reducing emissions. So again, the, what the world 50 years from now will be better than where it is right now. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. It's been a great discussion. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for the leadership of your company and thanks for your time today. If you enjoyed this week's episode, please leave us a rating and review on Apple and Spotify. This really helps us reach more listeners. You can also let us know what you thought via Twitter at ClimatePosiPod or email us at ClimatePositive at Hasse.com. I'm Chad Reed, and this is Climate Positive.